Evening, everybody. So not bad for dead week. We clearly have a guest who can raise the dead. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Tonight, we're going to do evaluation. So we're going to stop at 725. Um, Allie and Michelle will pass out uh, evaluations. We have one form for students and one form for people from the community. Um, so please get the right form. And then I need two student volunteers to stand by each door to collect them. Can I get a volunteer, two student volunteers? Thank you, one more. Thanks, okay, great. So these two people here will be at the doors collecting. And you might wanna divvy up and one of you take public, one of you take students. Um, there'll be no section uh, discussion tomorrow because it is dead week, so don't go looking for that. Um, and before I introduce Raj, um, I want to thank a few of the people who made this rather complex undertaking uh, happen this semester. Um, it took a lot of hands um, and quite a few wallets as well, actually. Um, uh, Alex Schwartz from Letters and Sciences was really key from the very beginning in helping us navigate. I, I mean, I don't normally teach undergraduates and I don't know how to navigate the bureaucracy, and, and she helped us do that, and it was invaluable. Um, I'm going to read off all the names, and then we can applaud them all at once. Uh, Ali Slegel and Michelle Konstantinovsky, you know, for helping not only to read your work, and by the way, we've got like a thousand reading responses that haven't been collected. If you want it back, if you need it back, you should email Michelle, because she's going to toss them in a day or two. Um, uh, but anyway, reading your work, but also organizing all the moving parts with such good cheer. Um, and they've been indispensable to the class. Someone you haven't met uh, who was also critical to this getting off the ground, who helped me put together the guest list and extended all the invitations and dealt with a lot of the logistics is Carolyn Fetterman, uh, who works with the Edible Schoolyard Foundation. Um, and also at the foundation, um, several others, Letitia Yang, Emily Joya, Stacy Slate, Chris and Nichols, Josh Cohen, and Camille uh, Nava um, all helped us uh, get our guests here safely, put them up, um, and uh, man the door, or woman the door, and um, uh, so we're also very important. Nikki Henderson, uh, who many of you have met, uh, led our discussion sections and gave an uh, inspiring lecture the other day. And um, she is someone else uh, with whom this class would not have been what it is. And then up in the booth, handling tech and telling me when all the Facebook pages are open, um, Ezra Daly, uh, Jeannie Schumacher, and the rest of the tech crew up there. Um, and lastly, I want to thank uh, some of the people who uh, opened their wallets to make this class happen. As I mentioned, it was an expensive undertaking. Uh, the Epstein family, uh, Bob, Amy, and Harris, um, uh, who have been here just about every class, if not every class, um, made a contribution that made this possible. And Alice Waters, of course, and the Edible Schoolyard uh, Foundation, um, all of whom have given the university and me and you this, this great gift. So can we have a hand for all the people who helped? Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now to our guests. Um, several of the people who've stood on the stage to educate you, I invited because they had educated me. And these were people I found my indispensable teachers uh, as I've you know, uh, gone about learning about our food chain and the food system. And on international questions, which is what we're gonna to address today, and we haven't really spent that much time on in the class, um, my indispensable teacher has been Raj Patel. Um, his book, and I met him first in the pages of his book, Stuffed and Starved, uh, and his speaking and his activism uh, all have schooled me in the international, the global dimensions of the food issue. Um, he's a master at connecting dots, uh, in helping us understand how food choices we make every day are affecting people living half a, half a world away, how American agricultural policies affect uh, the ability of people in other countries to feed themselves, um, and how um, 
trade rules uh, affects what shows up on our plates and on the plates of people in Mali or Ghana or wherever. Um, he's also connected the dots in a really interesting way in his book between the epidemic of obesity and world hunger, uh, two seemingly opposite phenomena that in fact are epiphenomenon of the same system. Um, He's a writer, an academic, and an activist. He's uh, had an amazing, uh, in addition to his academic uh, background, he's worked for the World Bank and WTO, World Trade Organization, and as you saw in his bio, he's also protested against those organizations. So he's been on both sides of the street. Uh, he's currently a visiting scholar at, at Berkeley Center for African Studies, an honorary research fellow at the School of Development Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Maybe he'll tell us exactly where that is. And a fellow at the Institute uh, for Food and Development Policy, also known as Food First. That's based in Oakland. And lately, he's been going around the world uh, researching, reporting on a book and a documentary, uh, looking at innovative ways that people are finding to feed themselves. And uh, I hope he'll share some of that with us. Many of you in our question period have posed the deep, hard question. How, is, uh, how are we going to feed the world, or how is the world going to feed itself when there are 11 billion or 14 billion people? Um, and Raj is a brilliant critic of the Green Revolution, which is his subject today. The Green Revolution is, is one of the <laughs> most controversial uh, and uh, pr dominant set of answers to that question. Um, Raj has some very interesting other answers and some ideas about how the question might be better phrased to how to feed the world. Um, and what happens when you reject the Green Revolution model, um, whether in its old form or its new form, what do you put in its place? Um, and I think you'll see that Raj has some uh, provocative answers to that question. So will you join me in welcoming Raj Patel? Thank you. Um, Thank, thanks very much indeed. Now, I, um, this is all new to me. I, I, I tend not to use PowerPoint because I, I take to heart the, the data that suggests that when you show PowerPoint, uh, audience IQs drop by seven points. Um, nonetheless, uh, today I have graphs, uh, and so I, I thought I would uh, see, see how this works, and, and I hope that you will forgive me if I screw it up or just spend a lot of time with this green dot, which I think is very exciting. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think... Uh, Let's, let's ask why the Green Revolution? Um, and the, the, why, why do we want to feed the world? And we'll, 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 we can, if we like, uh, to pick apart this, uh, the question of who the we is who's going to feed the world. But in general, uh, there have been, uh, I mean, I'm told with PowerPoint, we begin with a motivational slide. Uh, and here is the motivation. Um, here, here's here's uh, why it is that a lot of people think that it is a good idea to feed the world. Uh, and it is because when the world uh, goes hungry, they are angry. Uh, and there have been a number of food protests and food rebellions around the world, this uh, from 2008 in Haiti. Uh, and th this is uh, the, the, the specter of people taking to the streets because they are hungry is really the prime motivation for the Green Revolution. So, in, in other words, if, the, the question is, why do we want to feed the hungry? The reason is, for a lot of people, and particularly for a lot of policymakers, it's to avoid things that look like this. So, what, what exactly is the Green Revolution? Well, the, the, the Green Revolution, I mean, when you hear the Green Revolution, if you haven't heard of the, the, the term before, it, it sounds like it might involve sort of wind power, uh, or, you know, sort of tofu and sandals, and a sort of hippie takeover. Uh, you know, what we want is a Green Revolution, a lot more hemp. Um, but, uh, but actually, the, the, the Green Revolution, the, the, the term the Green Revolution itself it gives, you a, gives you a hint of, of where it's from. Uh, the man who coined the term the Green Revolution, was, uh, his name is William Goud. William Goud uh, coined this term in 1968 when he was, uh, the, uh, when he was talking to the Society for International Development. Uh, and he was the, uh, the administrator for the United States Agency for International Development. Uh, and he termed, uh, he, he called the, the Green Revolution, well, the, he, here's, here's the phrase um, that he used to, to coin the Green Revolution. He said, look, these and other developments in the field of agriculture contain the makings of a new revolution. It is not a violent revolution like that of the Soviets, nor is, is it a white revolution like that of the Shah of Iran. I call it the Green Revolution. 
So right there, even without knowing exactly what he's talking about, you can see that, that it, I mean, he's opposing it to communism. And in fact, the Green Revolution was a series of interventions of technological change, of uh, hybrid seeds, of irrigation, of uh, uh, engineering, uh, of, phys of physical and social engineering, uh, of a government subsidy and of political transformation uh, in order to, to grow more crops so that people wouldn't become communist. Now, th that sounds a bit weird, right? You know, growing food to prevent communism. Uh, but that, actually, the, 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 there's, there was some pretty explicit thinking about why more food would prevent communism. Uh, and it, it followed a sort of a logical argument that uh, drew on the thinkings of a man who was the world's first paid economist. And his name, name is Thomas Malthus. And Thomas Malthus was uh, an employee of the, the world's largest company, uh, the British East India Company. I mean, if you think Walmart is large, think, you know, sort of Walmart run amok. Um, and, uh, the, and he was responsible for bringing in uh, profits for, for the British East India Company, responsible as it was for, uh, for trade, for colonialism, for slavery, and a range of other things. Uh, one of the other things that Thomas Malthus do, did was ponder population. Uh, and th th there's a sort of a, a, a couple of curves associated with Thomas Malthus uh, that look like this. Um, now, I mean, ignore the numbers here. I mean, I, I, I sort of rather speciously put uh, the, the sort of crossover point here of uh, 19, around about 1980, 85, just because in the late 1960s, people were scared that in 1985, all hell would break loose. And all hell would break loose because of this mechanism that, that uh, Thomas Malthus has here. And the mechanism is this, pretty straightforwardly. He observed that uh, food grows, uh, the, the, the amount of food that is produced every year increases, but it increases at an arithmetic rate. So there's just an additional n amount of food produced every year. It's a sort of fairly straightforward slope. But, but population, population increases geometrically. Uh, population, you know, so, so someone will have four kids, and then those kids will have four kids, and then those kids will have four kids. And so you have a, an exponential rate of growth uh, of, uh, of, of population. At some point, uh, the amount of, uh, the, the, the number of people exceeds the food supply, and then all hell breaks loose. Uh, and that idea uh, of, look, what we need to do is to avoid that crossover point is one that informed the policymakers who were thinking of the Green Revolution very explicitly. And if that sounds antiquated and crazy, you know, the idea that, look, that look, we need to stop, we need to raise this green line here, we need to increase the amount of food, otherwise we'll have that crossover point. I am enjoying this green dot, by the way. This is a lot. Uh, we'll have this cross crossover point, and then oh, yeah, we need to prevent that. And you know, in order, if, if we just make sure that there's enough food, we will avoid social unrest and the, the, the cataclysm that will follow. Um, if you think that that's, that's a bit bonkers, Think about the Arab Spring, because what was the last thing that President Ben Ali of Tunisia did before he fled for Malta? The last thing he did was to drop the price of bread by 30%. And he drops the price of bread, why? Because at the back of the, his mind, Thomas Malthus is doing the thinking for him. Uh, at the back of his mind is an idea that what the population, you know, the population is, is sort of just gone crazy because they've not got enough food. We can subdue them by dropping the price of food and that will make them happy. Uh, now, I mean, as I say, this is thinking that is alive and well. You, you don't have to travel very far to find it. But it is incredibly reductive. It reduces, uh, I mean, it reduces the population, and usually this is poor people here, right? I mean, this, this isn't the rich. Uh, this, this population curve is constituted mainly of uh, the, urban, uh, the urban poor. And they're reduced basically to three organs, you know, that they are... They have grumbling stomachs, uh, so we think we have to worry about the food. And then, of course, they have raging genitals, uh, which is why they reproduce. Uh, and then, of course, at this point here, they have clenched fists, right? So it's about, I mean, it's an incredible reduction of the human population to some basic instincts of eating and shagging and fighting. Um, but this actually is, uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, it sounds absurd, but actually there's, there's a great deal of written documentary evidence that the Green Revolution was spurred by these kinds of concerns. Uh, and, uh, of course, to some extent, we, we need to acknowledge that by introducing fertilizer and pesticides and irrigation and support for certain kinds of farming, um, there were transformations in the amount of food that was produced. Uh, so rice production in Indonesia, to take one example, uh, increased by 275% uh, between 1966 and 2000. You had you know, similar sort of increases of 200 kilograms per year uh, per hectare in Chile in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, corn production there. And basically, I mean, you have a, a, a happy ending uh, for, this, uh, for people concerned about Malthusianism. 
you have uh, the world's cereal supply outstripping population. So while the population increased by 110% from uh, 1950 to 1990, global cereal production increased by 174%, postponing that, 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 that horrible moment of crossover. Um, and that sounds terrific. So we should ask, well, how did it happen? Uh, and the conventional story, and if, if those of you who, who did the reading, I know that there's no compulsion to do that, but, but uh, you, you would have read uh, Norman Borlaug's uh, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, no, Nobel expect, uh, ex acceptance speech, which he gave in uh, 1970. And the, the history of the Green Revolution is kind of there, so I, I won't rehearse it too much, but basically the, 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 the standard story is that Norman Borlaug uh, is brought by the Rockefeller Foundation to Mexico in 1940 in the early 1940s, uh, and he, uh, he breeds a, a race of uh, wheat that is incredibly high yielding, and because of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the US government, this spreads around the world, and uh, rice and uh, corn are also become a part of this, this engineering, this, this plant breeding miracle, and because of that, the world is fed, and we all live happily ever after. And that's the, the, the moment that, uh, in 1970, where Norman Borlaug kind of makes, this, makes, this, uh, makes his victory speech. Um, but it is important for us to ask a couple of questions. Why was he in Mexico in the early 1940s? And w w why Rockefeller? Why Mexico? Why Borla? So very quickly, here's why. Uh, I mean, to understand why the Green Revolution came about in Mexico in the 1940s, it's important to go to the 1930s, uh, where uh, Lázaro Cárdenas, uh, the, the, the president of Mexico, was busy engaging in uh, a suspension of private property rights. He was engaging in land reform. I mean, if you go to Mexico now, you can still find in, in areas where peasants have access to land portraits of Lázaro Cárdenas recognizing the, the valuable work he did in redistributing land, taking it from landowners, and making it available to peasants. Another thing that he was doing, he took, the, he took uh, private oil companies' uh, oil operations and nationalized them. In particular, he took the Standard Oil Company. Now, the Standard Oil Company was, if you don't know, run by the Rockefellers. I mean, it was, it, this was the wellspring of the Rockefeller money. And so what happened in 1940 was that Cardenas was out, and a more business-friendly, less futzen with property rights uh, president came in, Avila, uh, Avila Camacho. And Camacho signals his, I mean, his business-friendly credentials by, initially, uh, by immediately saying, uh, out, we're going to outlaw the Communist Party. Uh, and he makes, he makes very clear uh, overtures to the United States that this, uh, no more will Mexico uh, engage in nationalization or th th this kind of nonsense. Uh, and instead, uh, Mexico is open for business. And that's why the Rockefeller Foundation begins its work in, Mexi in, in Mexico, is because uh, they, uh, I mean, the Rockefeller Foundation doesn't want to see elsewhere in the world the kind of nationalization that they experienced in uh, Mexico. Uh, and they're in a, in a climate now where th their property rights are much more assured. And they bring Norman Borlaug. Borlaug uh, was, you know, was, doing, uh, was employed by DuPont. Uh, and he was doing very well there. In fact, they, they loved him so much that they wanted to double his salary to keep him there. But he was, he was motivated by uh, the, the urge of, I must feed the world, and I can. And so he left his job in the Midwest, and he left his uh, pregnant wife and child to, to come to Mexico and to start breeding plants. Now, what's interesting is the plant that he breeds. Um, then, as now, the majority of hungry Mexicans eat so he breeds wheat. Uh, and it's important to ask why. Uh, and he, he very explicitly says uh, that he wants to breed wheat because uh, he doesn't feel that the, the, the peasant agriculture, uh, uh, the, the peasant farmers have the capacity or the knowledge or the wherewithal to use the kind of sophisticated farming techniques that he has in mind. So he wants to go with the farmers who are, uh, who are commercial farmers, who have access to capital, access to irrigation, access to land, uh, access to money, and who, with wh whom he feels that the future of the Green Revolution will be much more secure. And, and similarly, oddly, when uh, uh, the, the Green Revolution gets to India, India, the land of you know, basmati rice and chapati, uh, what is it that the Green Revolution starts off with in India? Corn. Uh, so again, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that you have these, you know, these sort of moments of, of, of disjunction, but, but you can explain them by understanding that actually the Green Revolution was not intended to feed the rural poor. It was intended very explicitly, and again, you can see all this stuff in the, in, in the archives, to make sure that the places that got the Green Revolution, particularly India, but uh, throughout Southeast Asia uh, and Latin America, these places did not become any more communist than they were. Now, uh, you, again, when we think about the Green Revolution, we think, oh, well, it's Norman Borlaug and his seeds. Uh, and again, if you read the history, you know, Borlaug's uh, speech, you would think, yes, this is about seeds. It's about uh, you know, uh, plant breeding and irrigation. 
But actually, there are a couple of other things that they don't tell you about the Green Revolution. Um, well, first of all, I mean, obviously, there's a model of science here that goes very much unspoken. It's centralized. It's about a few experts doing it for the people. Uh, and again, if we're interested in who's the we who's going to feed the world, um, there's, it's important to be explicit about who the we is. And we can see this you know, sort of carried on till today. We can, we can find the, the Gates Foundation's idea of uh, who it is that's going to feed the world as, as being a very sort of centralized group of people. Um, this idea, I mean, actually, let's, I can do this with PowerPoint. We can go back in time. Um, remember that the, 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 the sort of Malthusian curve is, is not just about raising food, but it's about uh, bending the, the, the population curve as well. Uh, although we understand the Green Revolution today is around you know, being associated with pesticides and agriculture and fertilizers, if you look at the record in 1968 when William Goud was in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee testifying about all this, uh, he, the, the question they asked him and the, the co corporations that get named are corporations that deal very much with population control. It's very much about controlling women's fertility in, in developing countries. Uh, this population issue is one that's, you know, that, that's about a sort of centralized population control. Uh, the other thing that you don't often hear about when it comes to the Green Revolution is that it was about subsidies, huge subsidies. Um, the US, uh, again, when William Goud was testifying in, in the Senate, um, the chair of the committee said to him, look, there are farmers around the world who, who we know uh, would like to adopt these technologies, but they have nowhere to sell their stuff. They have no mechanisms for, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for marketing their crops. They, the, the, you know, the, the governments are just sort of sitting around uh, not, not helping them. And William Goud pushes back and says, no, no, no. Uh, if you look at the places where the Green Revolution is happening, if you look at the Philippines, at India, Pakistan, Chile, and Brazil, um, you will find, uh, and I'm quoting here, you will find where uh, higher prices given to farmers gets primary credit for providing the incentive to grow more. In other words, in all the countries where the Green Revolution happened, there was a huge amount of government investment in subsidy to encourage the farmers to grow more. While we think of Green Revolution today as uh, you know, just the seeds and the fertilizer, it was centrally about uh, subsidizing and supporting farmers, in this case, commercial farmers. The other thing, though, you don't, uh, you know, so, so you know, it, it involves the marketing boards. It involve, involves governments having grain stores so that they, you know, they have somewhere to stash all the grain that they're providing the incentive for farmers to produce. The other thing that you don't often get told is that in all the countries I just named, uh, well, the, the, that William Goud named, the Philippines, India, Pakistan, Chile, and Brazil, in the time of the Green Revolution, uh, was that the government was desperately anti-democratic and authoritarian. Uh, in these moments, you found, uh, I mean, look to India, for instance, where uh, as, uh, during the period of the Green Revolution and the, period, the emergency period, uh, where the Green Revolution was really pushed quite hard in India, uh, you had, uh, you, I mean, you had authoritarianism, you had a suspension of democracy, you had Sanjay Gandhi, uh, the uh, son of uh, Indira Gandhi, taking upon himself uh, the task of uh, doing some of this Malthusian work, and he was involved in forced sterilizations, uh, campaigns of forced sterilization of men and women uh, in order to you know, postpone the, uh, the, the, the sort of Malthusian collapse. And of course, uh, the, the, the problem, uh, and again, we, we can look to India to see these, there are huge environmental and social costs associated with these green revolution technologies. Um, if you, I mean, in India, for, for example, uh, the chief scientist in Punjab, Punjab being the kind of hub of where green revolution uh, technologies hit the road in India. The chief scientist in Punjab, whose job it is to make the green revolution happen, uh, was on NPR a, a, a couple of years ago. And he said that 70% of farmers in India ought to be going organic uh, because of the huge environmental and social costs associated with pesticides, with water mining, with de de depletion of soil quality, and a range of other things. Uh, and of course, uh, Punjab, the, the home of the, the, the Green Revolution, is now one of the states with the highest level of farmer suicide associated with uh, debt used to, to borrow more chemicals associated with trying to get higher yields, which eventually do not, um, do not appear. So now I, I, I want to, I feel like I'm doing a mashup here. You know, there's, there's the Green Revolution tune happening over here, you know, thunk, thunk, thunk. And now I, I, I want to, 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 to sort of mash in a different story. Um, because the Green Revolution is, uh, I mean, you, you have the sort of arc of the Green Revolution. Uh, and I suppose I, I should just complete that arc by saying, look, you, you could say, look, yes, there are environmental and social costs. Yes, there was authoritarianism. There, you know, there was a range of bad things that happened with this. Um, but you know, did it not end hunger? Did, at the very least, the Green Revolution not combat hunger? And I, I want to quote my friend Peter Rossett here. Uh, who said, look, if you eliminate China from the analysis of the Green Revolution, the number of hungry people in the rest of the world uh, actually increased 
uh, by 11%, from 556 to 597 million. Uh, in South Africa, for example, why per capita food supplies rose 8%, the number of people, hungry people went up by 19%. Um, so what's interesting here is, yes, there was more food produced. And today, uh, 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 and I want to quote Greg Page, who is the head of Cargill, one of the world's largest grain trading companies, we produce more calories per person than ever before in human history. So to some extent, you can say, yes, you know, the Green Revolution has produced more calories. Uh, but we are still living in a world where there are uh, just shy of 900 million people who are malnourished. Now, as a proportion of the population, yes, that's less than there was in 1968. But that's still quite a lot of people. Uh, and it comes as no, I mean, it, 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 it seems particularly absurd that the, we are producing more calories than ever before in human history, and we still have uh, nearly 900 million people who are malnourished. Uh, but of course, the Green Revolution was never intended to, to address this problem of redistribution per se. It was just to have enough food for poor people in the cities to eat, to have enough to eat so that they wouldn't go communist. Just you know, sort of bear that in mind. Now, um, what I want to do now, again, is, is this sort of mashup moment. I, I, I want to talk about financialization um, because the, uh, well, look, here's, here's where, where I'm, I'm going with this. I, I want to suggest that the Green Revolution didn't end in 1970. It has carried on in various ways, and it sits as a dead weight in our brains when we think about the policy futures, that, you know, the, the policy options we have when we think about feeding the world. The, the logic and the impetus of the Green Revolution is still with us. And to show that, I, I want to show that the, the, the Green Revolution is a long Green Revolution that has continued since 1970. Uh, and to do that, I want to use some social theory that, um, the, I mean, I, 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 I shouldn't, uh, I, I should just let this speak for itself. Uh, so there it is. Um, this is. This is inside baseball uh, in, uh, in international political economy. Um, and it is almost impossible to explain uh, right now, uh, except for this. I mean, this comes from an incredible uh, intellectual, uh, the late Giovanni Arrighi. Uh, Arrighi uh, points out that uh, there are, I mean, in the history of capitalism, all right, let's actually ignore this. I think there's an ignore button. There is, good. Pretend that that, that wasn't there. Um, in the history of capitalism, there have been uh, cycles of accumulation, and uh, you know, when empires rise and fall, they follow a kind of pattern. And the pattern is this, that, uh, and, and he, up, up there, well, maybe I can bring it back, Look, we've got the Genoese, we've got the Dutch, we've got the British, and we've got the US, uh, uh, the systemic cycles of accumulation. Now, basically, what, what he's saying is that the, the, all of these empires start off um, with a, a phase where they're, you know, the, 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 the sort of principal economic drivers, uh, the, the people who are in charge of the, the economic direction of these, these empires, are interested in producing stuff. They're interested in turning money into commodities, and that's, that's where they're headed. But at some point, there comes a crisis. And it, at that moment of crisis, uh, the, 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 the sort of relations of power, the, the people who get to set the terms of an economy change. And it stops being the people who are interested in manufacturing or in accumulating and in, in, uh, in turning money into commodities, and it starts being people who are interested in banking and finance, or turning commodities back into money. And this happens throughout history. Uh, and so he, he, he talks about the Genoese and the Dutch and the British cycles. Uh, and he suggests that in the United States, um, we've gone through that process as well. Through the 1970s, uh, we have had a, uh, you know, th these, these, these sort of cycles that he calls long centuries. Uh, so the long 15th and 16th, the long 17th, the long 19th. Uh, for, for Arigi, I mean, his, the book from which this is taken is called The Long 20th Century. And so that's why I'm, I'm thinking of the Green Revolution as a long green revolution. Because it doesn't end in 1970. Yes, uh, the, the, the US government takes a step back from its uh, you know, sort of primary duty in bankrolling all of this. And the foundations are uh, not able to, to bankroll this in the way that they used to. Um, and similarly, the, you know, the, there's, a, there's a sort of seismic shift in the politics of, uh, of the United States and of the world economy away from this politics of, you know, of a sort of Keynesian economics towards something that's more neoliberal, towards an economics that, is, that, that sees free markets as the engines of prosperity and growth, and that sees the government as the enemy of the free market. And so the, you know, the government has to sort of clear out. And interestingly, what you see in the second phase of the Green Revolution is uh, a process of sort of consolidation. So, all the things that the Green Revolution did in terms of grain stores, for example, in terms of marketing boards, all of that starts getting privatized. 
Um, and you know, th I mean, th th that actually is, is a process that still carries on till today. Uh, recently, Canada privatized the last of its grain marketing boards, uh, to much to the delight of some of the corporations that managed to concentrate that power. Um, at the same time, you, you, you start developing a sort of rich international web of markets. Um, the World Trade Organization is a, 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 a mechanism by which the world is stitched together in terms of uh, international markets. You don't have to worry about grain reserves anymore. If you run out of grain here, you can buy it over there. It, you're spending your hard taxpayer dollars on uh, a, a grain store is just a waste of money. Uh, you know, these mountains of grains, which sometimes will rot, are just a waste of time because ultimately, if you have a food shortage in one part of the world, you can get that food from somewhere else. And the, the, the logic, the, the, the strange sort of logic of that international sort of approach to markets is something that, that propels the World Trade Organization. Though, of course, it's important to remember the World, the World Trade Organization isn't about level playing fields at all, right? I mean, the WTO is, is an institution that disallows uh, you know, market supports for poor countries, while we in the United States and in Europe are allowed to keep our subsidies to the tune of, of several billion dollars a year. Um, at the same time, you, you see I mean, one of the other sort of hallmarks of, uh, 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 of uh, these, this sort of long century of this neoliberalism is the process of turning new things into stuff that can be bought and sold. Uh, and in particular, farmland in, uh, in poorer countries is, is now sort of on the, uh, a commodity that can be bought and sold. And uh, in, as I say, in, in 2010, uh, an area the size of France, particularly in Africa, was bought by uh, outside interests that were keen in, to, 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 to have, for the first time, access and control, direct control uh, of land uh, that they could use for agriculture. Um, and you have the rise of financial powers. You have the rise of corporations, uh, particularly in the banking and financial and trading worlds, who are incredibly powerful. Uh, and th th this sounds a little abstract, so I, I want to just give you a, um, a story about a food rebellion that happened uh, in uh, August and September in 2010, uh, just to give you a, a sort of uh, a flavor of what that's like. Um, and you know, bear in mind, there's this sort of neoliberal financial moment, this, 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 you know, this moment of financialization, of the rise of uh, the power of finance capital to be able to you know, take food and turn it into a commodity, take land and turn it into a commodity. That's all happening at the same time as a range of other things. Um, and so what we, have, what we had in 2010 was, were, were food riots that, that happened because the price of wheat went up by 15% uh, in just three days. And Mozambique uh, it was a, a country that, that desperately depended on wheat imports, and they couldn't afford them, and, and, and there, were, there were rebellions. Uh, but we need to understand why. So the first, re the first thing uh, is colonialism. We, we, I mean, Wheat has no business being uh, grown in Mozambique. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, the reason that people in Mozambique want their bread daily is because the Portuguese colonized them. I mean, th there's nothing natural about a taste for bread, and there's certainly nothing natural about a taste for bread in Mozambique, but the reason people want wheat in Mozambique in 2010 is because of a, 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 a history of colonialism. So let's just, let's just sort of observe that that's, you know, that's sitting in the background. Then it, it's important to remember that we had, uh, you know, I mean, we, we are living in a time of climate change. And in 2010, uh, there were incredibly, uh, th there were sort of 100 year uh, uh, heat waves in uh, a, a range of grain baskets, particularly in Russia. Uh, Russia was the third largest uh, grain exporter in uh, 2010. And so there, was, there were these heat waves. Um, but, you know, we've, and, and they, they were extreme. They were once in a hundred year heat waves. That's pretty bad. Uh, but still, there were, you know, th there's no reason for that to matter particularly um, because maybe there were, you know, there were other sources in which grain might, might have been uh, found. Unfortunately, because of the international, uh, because of tight supply in international markets, they really, you know, an incident in one part of the world has a huge ripple effect, particularly in somewhere like Russia. Um, the markets that were meant to be the, these sort of insurance mechanisms end up being the mechanisms through which, through which shocks are transmitted. So it stops being an insurance mechanism and it becomes a mechanism of spreading contagion. And that's, uh, and of course, it becomes much worse because, you know, sure, you have these mechanisms of international markets, but sure, yeah, and, and we've, we've had hot weather before. The trouble is that Russia was going through its sort of neoliberal moment. It was going, you know, in 2010, uh, they were going through the recession like everywhere else, and they were engaging in austerity like we are. Uh, and one of the things they did in 2010 was cut uh, the amount of funding they had for firefighters. 
Uh, so large fires were, were, were burning up the grain uh, in, in Russia. Uh, and that caused uh, you know, a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, 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 of volatility on the international market. Um, and you, you may think, well, at least Mozambique, you know, Mozambique sure, maybe they'd be able to grow their own food or find a substitute for it. But Mozambique is one of the places where land grabs were happening. Uh, so some of the best land in Mozambique uh, was actually lying fallow uh, because it had been bought in 2009, uh, 2008, uh, this land with access to water and access to resources uh, and infrastructure. But it was, it was the, the owners of the land were waiting for the price of oil to go up so they could grow uh, uh, Jatrafa on it. Uh, so so they, they were speculating on this land, waiting for, uh, waiting for uh, the ability to produce biofuels on the best land. So at the same time as you have you know, people going hungry in Mozambique, some of the best land is locked up by speculators based in the United Kingdom. And then, of course, there's this company, um, one that you may not have heard of. Uh, Glencore is one of the world's largest grain trading companies. It is uh, actually a large mining company as well. Uh, but Glencore uh, controls 25% of the global barley market. It is a financial powerhouse uh, recently floated. It was the first company ever to, to, to be floated on the Financial uh, Times uh, 100, uh, the FT, FT, FTSE, the Financial Times Share Exchange, uh, and uh, come in uh, you know, within the, the, the top 100. It was an amazingly large company. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, one of the founders of the, uh, the company was, was known as the $10 billion man for the amount of money that he made on that deal. Uh, and Glencore's trading desk had a word with the Russians, and they said to the Russians, you know what, you should probably, uh, you should probably restrict your grain sales, because in the long run, it'll be better for Russia not to be exporting your grain. You need to feed your country. And three days later, that's what the Russians did. Uh, so, on the, possibly on the advice of Glencore, we, we can't prove this, but uh, there is a correlation between Glencore going to Russia and saying, look, you, in, institute an export ban, and then Russia institutes an export ban. Uh, so they stop exporting. The third, third largest exporter uh, listens to one of the world's largest financial powerhouses, stops exporting, and the price of wheat goes up by 15%. And the result is that, that Mozambique runs out, uh, and there are bread riots in Mozambique. Uh, and over a dozen people are killed. Uh, the government says that uh, initially they, 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 they tried to use rubber, billet, rubber bullets to disperse the protesters, uh, but they ran out of rubber bullets, and so they had to use live ammunition. <laughs> that's, that's what happened, and that's how they died. Um, and, but you know, when, you see the, when you see the papers, when you see the pictures, I mean, if we go back to that first picture of people protesting, what you see is this sort of mass of people who are hungry and angry, and, and there may be some Malthusian thinking uh, happening in the back of your brain. Uh, but actually, the, the story of food rebellions is always more complex, and it has become systematically even more complex now because of uh, we're living in a time, as I say, of climate change, of these tight -hit financial markets, and these new uh, financial players. But I want to suggest, uh, and I, I, I know I'm, I'm pushing up against time, um, I, I, I want to suggest a, a couple of things, maybe two, two, two more um, sort of big ideas. First of all, I want to suggest that food rebellions that happen are not to be feared. Food rebellions are not scary. Well, I mean, they're scary if you're in power. Uh, but some of the most important food rebellions that have happened around the world have within them the seeds of some important change. Uh, you've got Jean-Bertrand Aristide there. I don't know if you can see that. It says Lopez Obrador. This is a, 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 a poster from a food rebellion that happened in the United States in 1917. Uh, th these, these were women who were part of a, uh, a socialist, uh, possibly a socialist or an anarchist uh, women's collective. They were protesting for the right to vote. And when you have these food rebellions, when you see people taking to the streets angry and wanting food, they're usually coming not you know, with these simple kind of grumbling stomachs, clen clenched fists, but they're coming with visions for politics for change. When you see these, you know, when you see these protests, you may see you know, the, the maddened crowd, but you should also look for the visions of political change that people are coming with. Because people are coming with ideas of their own. Uh, while you know, the, the, the policymakers scared of communism um, were, m might not see that in a crowd, I mean, if we're interested in thinking about ideas for, for social change, it's worth looking to see what visions of social change there are. Um, and there are some terrific ideas coming up from, uh, the, f from uh, movements around the world. And in fact, I, 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 I can, if, 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 I, if, if I may, I, I do want to tell you about something we've seen when we've, we've been traveling the world with the Generation Food Project. Uh, th this is the documentary I've been working on because it provides an interesting alternative to 
uh, the, the ideas of the green revolution that still stick with us. I mean, while we are told by policymakers that the, the way we are to feed the world is to have a new green revolution, we're going to use genetically modified crops, or maybe we won't use genetically modified crops, we'll, 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 but we will come with uh, our new breed, you know, new sort of monocultures uh, that our best experts will, will raise, and they will, be, you know, they, they will be responsible for huge increases in yield. Um, the, the kinds of model that I'm excited about decentralize that science recognize that farmers are themselves scientists and that they engage in experiments and science every day. Uh, instead of worrying about population growth and sort of ranting on about sterilization, um, actually the, the kinds of models that matter are ones that involve women's education and women's empowerment because as we know, it, one of the best ways for uh, fertility rates to go down is when women are educated and are able to be empowered. Uh, when, uh, and instead of subsidies for large farmers and for industrial agriculture uh, and nothing for the rest, a flip uh, so that we're looking at investment in sustainable farming. Instead of privatized control of grain reserves and of speculation, uh, a, 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 a push towards public research, public grain stores, and recognition that we are going to have to take on corporations, and that involves trust busting. Uh, so uh, the, the examples of sort of food sovereignty and agroecology that I'm excited about are embodied in a story that I want to tell you from Malawi. And this, this will be the story I want to end on. Um, so Malawi is an interesting place. Malawi is uh, a country that uh, is landlocked and incredibly poor. And is, uh, I mean, it, it's a place where the, the, the major export crop is tobacco. Uh, and the price of tobacco has not been, you know, it's, it's not been great. Uh, so Malawi, first of all, is, you know, thinks that's, you know, what we need to do, we need to, Actually, we need to start investing in agriculture, is what uh, the, the Malawian government thinks in 2000 and, well, I mean, really from the late 1990s, but it really kicks it up in 2007. Uh, and what they decide to do against World Bank advice, against the donor advice, what they decide to do is go the green revolution route. And so they uh, invest in fertilizer. Trouble is, with, when you're buying fertilizer and you're Malawi, you don't have a whole lot of foreign exchange. You have this much foreign exchange. Uh, this is a... This is an economic quantity here. Uh, and, and, and they drive it down, because unfortunately in 2008, the agricultural commodity, you remember 2008, where the food prices were going through the roof, right? Uh, but the agricultural commodity in 2008 that goes up highest in price is fertilizer. So Malawi buys at the top of the market when it's really expensive, and, the food price, and so Malawi runs out of, of foreign exchange. Um, and so that, that means that there's no money for gasoline, there's no money for fuel, and there are huge lines, uh, and then there are huge, pro that there are protests in, uh, uh, in Malawi uh, as a result of this. And, you know, th these are basically green revolution protests, people protesting that, that there's no money left for them to be able to take to the, you know, to be able to drive around. Um, and, but you may say, well, look, that's fine, but didn't Malawi do quite well in 2008? I, I hear from Jeffrey Sachs that actually things turned out pretty well in Malawi in 2008. Uh, and Jeffrey Sachs is very keen in, in noticing that actually grain, uh, the, the yields doubled in 2008. And you may think, well, that, we, sh we, should, we should be doing the Green Revolution, surely. Green Revolution, good thing. Fertilizer, thumbs up. The thing is, uh, actually, <clears throat> in 2000, uh, from 2008 to 2009, where this, this huge yield increase happened, the majority of that yield increase is explained by the return of the rain. Um, rain has become so bearable in Malawi that yes, you know, some years it's incredibly crap, and then you, you will have the perfect conditions, and that just happened to coincide with the, these fertilizer vouchers. And so it looked like the Green Revolution was terrific and did, did a great job. In fact, it only increased yields by 15% if you isolate the, the fertilizer vouchers. And now, of course, Malawi's in the awful position of <clears throat> kind of being hooked on fertilizers, but having no money to do it. So that doesn't sound like any of those things. Uh, which is why I want to tell you the story from northern Malawi, uh, because in northern Malawi uh, there was a, a really interesting experiment uh, that's been going on for quite some time uh, that involved, uh, it's called the Soil, Food, and Healthy Communities Project. And they are uh, a group that, that is in, interested in agroecological farming. Uh, and the kinds of farming that they do involve things like cow pea and millet and sorghum. Uh, and they, they plant leguminous trees, so trees, trees that fix nitrogen in the soil. So it it's, you know, it's, it's actually improves soil fertility, plus they're trees. And, and that's important because um, with climate change, uh, photos, photosynthesis uh, kind of stops at, at above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it gets hotter than that in the dry land uh, farming uh, systems that they have there. So actually having shade cover increases yield. Uh, so this is, this is, this is a terrific system. 
And you have, uh, and so th th through this sort of sophisticated intercropping and working year round and uh, you know, uh, using the, the, sort of, uh, the organic matter in the soil, they are able to outperform even the systems with fertilizer. And they do this with 5,000 farmers, you know, sort of decentralized knowledge, decentralized science. Um, and, uh, and, and so you end up with this terrific uh, sort of abundance of food. And now here's the interesting question. How is it possible to have more food in the fields? There's more food uh, growing out of the fields, but how is it possible for more food to be in the fields and for child malnutrition to go up? How is it possible there's more food in the fields and kids are go infants are going hungrier? Take a guess. It's been exported. Uh, no, because in this case, it's millet and sorghum and cowpea. These are not exported. Uh, these are actually for domestic consumption. Yeah. It's, it's a good, uh, children's nutrition, uh, children need more nutritiously dense food. Well, that's right, but, uh, but that's not the answer. Uh, they, they, they do need more nutritionally dense food than millet and sorghum and, uh, and cowpea, but, but why is it that they're going hungry? Come on. Take a guess. They can't afford it. Uh, no, because this is, this is actually stuff that's, that's, that's grown at home for them. There's no money involved here. It's diverted as animal feed. That's, uh, in this case, no. I mean, th th there are animals that form part of the ecology. But no, in this case, it's, it's actually a majority for uh, local consumption. Yes. Uh, tell me more. They're not getting it to the right people. No, uh, that's not right. Uh, but, but, uh, but good guess. Last, last guess. Yeah. International markets somehow screwing up the price. Well, it, 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 possibly. But since this is actually for domestic consumption, the price has nothing to do with it. The answer is that, and it has everything to do with the point number two there. The answer is that harvesting is women's work. And when harvesting is women's work, and breastfeeding is women's work, and so is cooking and cleaning and, uh, uh, you know, and, and carrying wood and water, uh, then you still, you know, women will still have to harvest. But there's more to harvest. And there's still the wood and the, the cleaning and the cooking. So breastfeeding is a thing that drops out. So you need to have women's education and women's empowerment as part of the process. How do you do that? How, how, do, you get, you know, how do you reduce women's burden in, involved in all this? Take a guess. Make men cook. So, um, and so that's, uh, and I think this is a nice place to, to uh, we're coming to the end here, I, I'm running over just a little bit, but it's, it's such a good story and it's so appropriate for edible education. Um, that, uh, so, so, so they try and make men cook, and initially they go door to door, and they are, uh, so this is a farmer's group in Malawi, and they go around with a nutritionist and, uh, you know, and, and fellow farmers, and they go into the house, and it's like, hello, yes, we're, you know, we're here to teach you to cook. Uh, man, here we are. Look, we're, we're, you, you may have seen a pot before. Yes, I've, I've seen one of those. My wife often, often stood over one of those. Yeah, well, now, here's how you use it. You put some stuff in, you put it on the fire, and you stir it around a bit, and then, you, look, it's delicious. And the man's like, well, thanks very much. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. Uh, and then uh, uh, you know, everyone leaves, and it's like, well, fuck that. Uh, and, 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 the, and so you have these sort of rather disappointing uh, results where, when they went door to door. So instead, what the farmers decided to do was then to have uh, a, a public uh, event, uh, what's called a recipe day. And these recipe days are very interesting because they are, uh, first of all, they are moments where people learn how to cook and share recipes. Uh, and that's important because remember, what are, what are they growing? They're not growing corn. They're growing millet and cowpea and sorghum. And no one knows what they are. Uh, I mean, you know, th th these are, I mean, uh, people sort of know what millet is, but sorghum and cowpea, these are things that have been absent from the diet for, for, for generations. You know, I mean, people know that they're nutritious, but they don't really know what to do with it. It's like kale. Um, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, it, it's like, well, I mean, I, 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 I have, theoretically, I know I, this is probably good for me, but no idea what to do with it. So they exchange these recipes together. And uh, as a result, you, you see sort of increased uh, nu sort of nutrition outcomes. But you also see, because these are uh, events where women and men get to, uh, you know, to, to cook together, you see men uh, for the first time emerging into the, uh, entering into these spaces and experimenting with new ways of being. Uh, and so it's not like a carnival. Uh, although you know, when men come for the first time, it's interesting because there's, there's a kind of, you know, I mean, it feels weird, right? I mean, and they're very embarrassed, and there's a kind of, oh, God, yeah, look at me, I'm a little girl, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mashing my soybeans. Uh, and, and, and there is that real sort of deep discomfort. But what they're entering is, is what, what we might call a sort of prefigurative community, a community of being different that is radically equal. Uh, and it's, 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 it's people experimenting with a sort of radical equality uh, that 
actually seems to stick. Because by making it a joyful experience, by making it an experience where, uh, where equality prevails and that you feel better and stronger afterwards and that you have fun, uh, by using the, you know, the joy of the food as a mechanism for social change, they find, and we're in the process of rigorously proving this, we have anecdotal evidence where we're looking for the, the, the rigorous data, uh, that male participation in households goes up and so then does nutrition and so does a range of other things. Uh, and this happens because of, uh, 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 you know, for, through women's education and women's empowerment. But it also happens through the investment in sustainable farming systems. It happens through the public research. It happens through, um, uh, through uh, sort of, uh, public credit. Um, and this is an example of, thing, of, of things being driven by what, what we might call food sovereignty. This is a vision of the future that is about democratic change. Uh, where women and men are equal. And uh, you know, the, we see this idea of food sovereignty around everywhere. Uh, food sovereignty, uh, for those of you who haven't come across the term, it's really about um, a, 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 everyone being, uh, having access to a democratic food system. Food sovereignty is this idea that was put out by an international peasant movement called La Via Campesina. Food sovereignty is this idea that, uh, I mean, it's about uh, everyone having equal say in their food system, sometimes for the first time. But if we're going to have equal say, then we need equality everywhere from you know, international organizations down to the household. And that's why one of the slogans about food sovereignty is food sovereignty is about an end to all forms of violence against women. Uh, because it is, uh, it's about you know, eradicating structural inequality, whether that's violence in the household or violence through uh, international economic uh, mechanisms. Uh, and of course, the, the kinds of farming systems that, that, that are involved are agroecological. They're climate change ready. They're about uh, you know, a diversified portfolio of approaches to, to farming in the 21st century. And what I love about you know, these examples in Malawi and you know, some of the other examples we're following in Generation Food is that they unthink what the Green Revolution has thought for us about how science should be, about how society should be, about how money should be, about how government should be, and about what democracy should look like. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, and, and re really what, what makes it such an, uh, an appropriate story to maybe end this course is that what makes it really sail is uh, not just the democracy, but the joy, and uh, the, the joy that ultimately comes through uh, people cooking together as equals and eating together as equals too. Uh, thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Have a seat. I, I will do that. You guys have any questions? Yeah, I'm sorry I went on so long. No, no, no. It was perfect. It was perfect. Um, let me start with one then. Um, you dwelled more on the, the first or the first part of the Green Revolution than the second. Mm. And there is obviously a new Green Revolution, right, mm -hmm. that we're hearing a lot about. In Africa, um, Kofi Annan is involved, the Gates Foundation. To listen to those people promoting this new vision of a green revolution um, is to think that they've absorbed a lot of the critique that you made. In other words, if you talk to people at the Gates Foundation, they talk about empowering women as being a very important part of the new green revolution. Mm. They talk about um, sustainable agriculture, although we know that's a kind of it's a slippery squishy, thing, yeah. squishy term, um, and they talk about. Um, I mean, their rhetoric is is updated, mm. and and not just about seeds, but about soil health and all this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, so, is this new green revolution different, or is it same old, same old? In your view, it's. Well, I mean, it, that's a great question. I, I think. I mean, when you and you're right. You know, there is the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Kofi Annan is is very excited about that. Um, it seems, well, first of all, I mean, it's important to remember that when this Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa is calling for a Green Revolution, they explicitly don't talk about the state. They don't talk about state subsidies. They don't talk about the governmental infrastructure that made the first Green Revolution possible. Um, now, that's not a, an updating. That's actually a systematic amnesia. Um, I mean, and I think it's important to remember that, that the, the Green Revolution as we see it here wouldn't have succeeded without massive state intervention. Uh, but they want, they want somehow for that to happen without state intervention. Uh, and that's because essentially what they're looking for is a privatized, uh, I mean, yeah, a privatized version of the Green Revolution. Um, so, I mean, let's be kind to them and say even, let's imagine they have taken on board all these criticisms. In a second, I'll tell you why they haven't. But imagine that they have. There's still something a little, a little wrong about the world's richest man uh, engaging in 
you know, uh, philanthropy to be able to save people in Africa when, firstly, people in Africa have plenty of ideas about how, to, how they would like to grow food for themselves. And I think there's something deeply anti-democratic about philanthropy. I mean, you know, here's a man, that we, we, and we should be taking some steps back uh, when we hear about philanthropy and say, well, look. You're talking about Bill Gates. I am talking about Bill Gates and the, the, the Gates Foundation. How, how did this man get to be so rich? He gets to be rich through you know, a, a monopoly patent uh, on uh, you know, an operating system that explodes when you touch it. Uh, but uh, but you know, it's, it's a model of science and a model of engineering that's about you know, let, let, let the experts prevail and, and don't you worry your pretty head about it. And we see that, that actually in farming, that's, that's precisely the opposite of what needs to happen. So this, this sort of technocentric, uh, anti-political um, way of, of doing development seems to me misguided, particularly when it comes to agriculture. But you do hear a lot about women's empowerment, and you do hear and a lot small about holders, and small too. holders, That's too. That's a term you hear all the time. But you, you don't hear so much about the things that certainly I hear when I, when I talk to smallholders, which is about um, you know, democratic access to land or to water, um, you know, or land reform. In fact, you hear the opposite in, in, in one of the Gates Foundation's documents we found. Uh, we heard this term, land mobility. And land mobility is uh, where the land stays put, but the people on the land move, uh, so that the farms can become bigger and, you know, and be more efficient. Uh, and that's, that seems to me the opposite of a, a genuine sort of concern with you know, redistribution or with, with thinking about what, it, what actually works in, in, uh, in, in policy. I mean, if we're talking about women's rights, I mean, when you read the documents, it's about women need access to seed. And of course, you know, who, can, who can agree? But I think that there's a strange elision because I don't think women's rights was ever won by women having access to beans. Um, this is not Jack and the Beanstalk. I mean, the, the women's rights are more than access to seed. And when you talk about access to water, when you talk about access to education, and we talk about access to property and to uh, you know, things beyond property, that's where the rhetoric starts to sort of flag a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is the role of seeds, though, in this? I mean, is it, is it important that, you know, we, we, you are talking about, when you celebrate uh, Malawi, you're talking about increasing yields mm. as an important thing that needs to happen. Um, so is there a role for breeding, or should this all happen in situ with you know, the biodiversity that's already present? I think there's absolutely a role for science and for uh, research uh, of the kind, uh, research into agroecology of the kind, for example, that Miguel Altieri does here. Uh, and the, the kind of investment in science uh, and you know, in, in seeds that will get us to a, a better, you know, to, 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 to more sophisticated agricultural systems. But I think what we've done is allowed Norman Borlaug's sort of ghost to turn seeds into, you know, into this sort of Jack and the Beanstalk instrument, where everything is about the seed and very little is about the systems, the social systems in which the seed resides. And that's why the story from Malawi is interesting. It's like, look, even if you have more food, you can still have increased levels of hunger. And without attending to those social systems and systems around distribution, uh, you're, you, you, you turn seed into a fetish. So, fetish. so I certainly think, yes, we need investment in, uh, in public science that is distributed, that is about you know, attending to local agroecological systems and, and you know, addressing issues, for example, like scale. I think these are really interesting problems. But I don't think that a sort of narrow-minded monoculture is, I mean, I think monoculture, if, if you're obsessing about a single kind of seed, there's usually, again, a kind of thinking that's about monoculture. And when you have thinking about monoculture, you're moving one step away from diversification. And in a time of climate change, that's a bad idea, because climate change is about change. I mean, we've, I think I've, I've, we've spoken before about how um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, for example, thinks that it would be good if there were a gene for climate change. And Monsanto's promised us one. Well, and, and bless them, they are mad. Uh, but I mean, because I mean, think about it. Look, climate change is change. It is you know one year too much rain, another year too little. Sometimes a pest that you've never seen before. Sometimes you know, the, you know plague of locusts, toads falling from the sky. Uh, and, and and so you don't know what it means. So how can you have a gene for that? And of course, there's you know there's we've moved beyond the one gene, one trait kind of thinking a, a long time ago. And particularly if we don't know what is coming down the track, surely a portfolio is much more sensible than a, you know, a, a single bet. I'd love to hear from some of you. Have we got a student with a question? Are you a student? No. OK. <laughs> uh, do, <laughs> let's have a student first. Jeannie?
Let me rephrase that a little for you. I mean, one of the, uh, that I think is implicit in that question, we've talked about how globalized these, these mm. agricultural markets have been and how they, how they convey shocks mm. rather than in, provide insurance. I wonder if at this point in history it's possible for either states or communities, um, either in Africa or India or here, to withdraw from that. Hmm. And get uh, you know the security that would come from not being at the mercy of uh, speculators and biofuels and um, is that possible? Uh, it's, it's to insulate yourself from that market. I think it's possible for at the at the national level to uh, think about strategies as many countries now have of uh, of buffers. Uh, so things like grain stores, for example, are increasingly in fashion in countries where uh, there are, um, you know, where where they are import dependent, uh, and you're seeing that you're seeing a range of countries adopt a language around the right to food. Uh, Olivier de Schutter, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, has a number of uh, uh, of sort of cases where uh, countries are moving you know, moving away from. Uh, a kind of mo trade monomania and starting actually to, to be very concerned with the mechanisms whereby people in, in their own countries get to eat. Uh, so, but, but it's, it's hard to, for, for countries at the moment to, to maneuver out of their commitment to the World Trade Organization. Um, and I think that that's, that's why organizations like La Via Campesina are still pushing very hard to remove uh, agriculture from the WTO because it is, uh, I mean, it, it is a, 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 a sort of precondition of people being able to have democratic discussions around this that that happen. Um, so it is possible, I mean, it's possible in principle, you're seeing some of the mechanisms like, um, like grain stores, for example, and investment in sustainable agriculture happening. You're seeing places like Bolivia, for example, that's, that's starting to you know, have, have language around food sovereignty be uh, sort of constitutionally um, ad admitted. But it's, we're still at the early stages of, of the actual policy of that playing out. So I mean, I think that, that we're in, at this moment in the history, more and more places are recognizing that this is, a, this is a problem. But they've often signed agreements that make it very hard to do right, that. Right, exactly. Right. Now, a question that I, I, I can imagine hovering over many of the students in the room is, uh, how can people in uh, the first world and how can people in here um, have a positive impact? Um, you've said in a way that, that charity isn't the way. Um, uh, but we, you know, how does the food movement here and the ability of individuals here to make different kinds of decisions, either in their voting mm -hmm. uh, or in their personal food choices, um, offer any kind of um, support for the, the food sovereignty movements you're describing? Well, I mean, I think we bear a, a great deal of responsibility in the United States because, uh, and Jeannie was right, I, I, I kind of let the World Bank and the World, World Trade Organization a little bit off the hook here. Uh, and I want to stick them back on the hook, uh, if, if, if I can. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, because they, they operate in our name uh, and they operate in large part with our money and uh, with one of our citizens at the head of the, the, <clears throat> uh, of the World Bank, uh, we, I mean, it's our government that's, that's kind of allowing this to happen. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that although it feels like just one more thing for the food movement to do, um, it is important for us to recognize our debt. Um, I mean, in a sense, of course, we're always, you know, when you see these, the, the, the pictures of uh, people with big brown eyes going hungry on the screen, it's like, my heart reaches out to them, I must do something. And, and that's important. It's important to recognize the sort of dignified emergency that, that exists. But it's also important to stop kicking them in the teeth. Uh, and I think that's what the policy that our government allow, I mean, that, that, that is, happens in our name, does. So one of the most constructive things that we can often do is stop what we are doing. Um, we can certainly stop the dumping of our crops at below the cost of production in countries in the global south. That takes work. That, you know, that, that means getting involved in you know, activism around the farm bill, which is God knows it's thankless. Uh, but it is important. Uh, and it is important. I mean, it, it, it's an important agenda item for us if we are interested in sustainable agriculture, not just here but around the world, is actually we need to, to transform this farm bill into something that isn't about uh, farming that stops it and makes it impossible for people in other countries to farm themselves. So I think that there's, there's stuff we can do in terms of the farm bill, in terms of, the, of our government's policy at the, at the World Bank, and you know, th there are a range of policies actually that we can, that are low-hanging Including fruit. the one that, that the only way we give food aid in this country is in the form of grain, uh, not money. Right, uh, and, and this is, you know, this is an old- explain that? Yeah, this is yeah. an old sort of Cold War thing where, um, 
at the end of the, the, the Second World War, uh, the, you know, Europe had, had been devastated and Europe, the US had been sort of busy shipping uh, US grain over to Europe. Uh, and Europe was, was now in the position of wanting to rebuild its own agriculture system. So it's like, no thanks, America. You, you know, cheers, Uncle Sam, but we're, we're going to try and grow our own grain. So now the US found itself in a position where it had a lot of excess you know, surplus on the farm and no one to take it. Luckily, there was communism. Uh, and again, the, the, the food aid regime, PL480, no one here knows what it is, but everyone, for example, in India knows exactly what PL480 is, because it was, the public law 480 was uh, instituted to dump US crops in, uh, in countries that were liable to go communist, uh, India being one of them, but you know, around the world. And so it was a way of shipping US food on US carriers to countries that were liable to go communist. And it was one of the ways in which uh, India was kept under the US chain. Uh, throughout the 1960s, where um, uh, you know, uh, President Johnson was authorizing food aid shipments month to month. Now, no one here knows, knows that, but everyone in India knows that because of a period of great national humiliation. Uh, and th that, those laws are still on the books. Um, and so uh, we still have, as part of our sort of support for US farmers, laws that are about you know, shipping food from here all the way over there, when in fact most of the rest of the world has moved away from that, uh, from this tide aid, because they recognize what Amartya Sen, the, the, the great Nobel Prize winning economist, observed, which is that in a time of famine and hunger, there's usually food available in the area. The reason that we don't have, uh, I mean, the, the reason people go hungry is not because there's a shortage of food wherever it is that there's hunger. There's plenty of food, but it's usually being hoarded in a, in a very economically rational moment because if, I, if I'm rich enough to buy food I, and I know the price is going to go up, I'm going to hang on to that until the price goes up. Uh, and in speculating uh, on the price of food, uh, the, the people who, don't, who can't afford the food starve. So the, the way that most development agencies have discovered is you buy food locally. You, you know, I mean, this is the kind of the Berkeley approach. You buy, you, you, you eat local. Um, but, but actually, it's an, it's an incredibly good way of, of, of building local economies and, and keeping farmers going in a time when otherwise you're dumping stuff from Kansas and the farmer gets wiped out. Right. And it was actually uh, President Bush who tried to change it. It was. And, uh, and was overruled by the Ag Committees in, in I think, both houses of mm -hmm. Congress. Uh, question from a student. Yes. Did they do anything? <laughs> Um, th 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 those are two incredibly good points. And, and so, so let me start with the, the women's education. The reason I put that up there was just to balance um, the, the population control point, because th th those were mirror images of the Green Revolution point. And for me, wh whenever I hear uh, population control, um, I, immediately, I, I, I get hives. Uh, because usually, w when you hear people talking about population control, they're they have, uh, they often have a kind of racist agenda, where, which is about controlling the fertility of poor women by force. Uh, and what, what I'm keen to do is shift that conversation and say, look, if you're interested in women's fertility and women being able to control their own fertility, the best way of doing that is through girls' education and women's education. I mean, there, there's just, I mean, if there's one development policy that does more than anything else, the one thing, it's girls' education. And so I, I think, you know, that, that's why I put that up there. Um, but you're right you know, to, to ask the question, well, what the hell are men doing? And that's what the women ask in these, in these, in these venues, right? It, it, which is, now, it, traditionally, men are involved in, uh, I mean, th there's a very gendered division of labor, so men will be involved in plowing uh, and uh, in taking food to market. Um, but, you know, the, 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 precisely, the, there's a deeply unequal division of labor where women are, are doing the, the, the carrying of water and the range of other things. Uh, is, is, is sort of fairly static. And what these spaces do uh, is create an opportunity for these inequalities to be named in a way that's safe. Uh, so, this, I mean, women are empowered in these spaces to be able to say, look, there's, there's something very, very wrong here where I'm doing all of this stuff and you're sitting on your ass doing nothing. Uh, and, or, or you know, you're taking the stuff to market and you're drinking it away. Now, what's different is that in these spaces, 
uh, because they're, they're sort of public, uh, they, they take a, what would ordinarily just be a quarrel, right? I mean, this is just a domestic dispute. And it becomes a safe space to be able to, to, to explore a world where things are more equal. And you also see that in relationships between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. There's, there's uh, you know, it's a universal thing. that the, the Relationships between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law are often fraught. Uh, but in these spaces, uh, what you see is that daughters-in-law are able to ask their, or, or be able to push back against their mothers-in-law because there's, uh, there's some pretty bad advice that comes from mothers-in-law because of colonialism that, that kids need to be weaned at two months and given oats and water, and that's, that's bad advice. And uh, you know, the, 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 the mothers who are breastfeeding, getting that advice from their daughters-in-law are not happy about it. Uh, these spaces become spaces where they can push back against that. And so that's what's interesting about these spaces for me is that, yes, it's about women's empowerment, but it's, but it's, it's, it's about you know, a space that's about equality. It's certainly about men being schooled, but it's also about a certain kind of radical equality that I think we need much more of as well. Great. We're going to wrap up. Um, I, I urge you to read Stuffed and Starved, Raj's book, if you're interested in, in following up on these issues. And also, his, he's got a new... Um, article in the Journal of Peasant Studies, is that right? Uh, about the Long Green Revolution, which is absolutely terrific. Um, so uh, I'll send out a link to that on BSpace. Um, but uh, remember, stick around for evaluations, please. Uh, Michelle and Allie will um, hand them out and then give them to the person at the door. And before you stand up, please join me in thanking Raj Patel.